those that are here and those may be watching online. I'm ready this morning. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Let us open up this morning's Sunday school lesson in prayer. Our Father and our God, we come before you this morning, first of all, thanking you, Father God, for being God all by yourself. Thank you, Father God, for seeing that we had a sin need that can only, only be solved by the blood of your son, Jesus the Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your son into this world to take on the sins of this world, to go to the cross and die for our sins. But Lord God, you raised him to eternal life so that we may have eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, our comforter and our guide. Thank you, O oh Father God, for this glorious day, a day we've never seen before and we'll never see again. We pray, O oh Father God, that you would bless all those that are here. Bless those who may be on their way. Bless those who are watching online. We ask, O oh Father God, that you would bless our pastor. Pray, Father God, that you would fill him with your Holy Ghost power to bring forth your message to your people. Lord, bless him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet and bless his family, Father God. And Lord, we pray that you would bless each member of this church. Each member, Lord. We pray, Father God, that you would bless your pastors and churches everywhere. And Lord, we pray that you would bless those who are in nursing homes and hospitals and behind prison walls and in foreign lands. Oh, Father God, that are first facing oppression that are facing cruelty. Lord, we pray that you would bless our children and keep them safe, Lord God. Bless our streets, O oh Father God. It's unsafe to go from corner to corner nowadays. We ask, O oh Father God, that you would keep us safe. And now, Lord, we ask that you would just bless us all here together and be within the midst and help us to study this word so we will know what it is you have for us to do. In the holy, precious, and excellent name, of Jesus the Christ, we pray and say, amen. amen. Our lesson this morning is a, called an out-of-the-book lesson, and it's entitled The Gospel Truth. We got that title from my granddaughter, Nisa, <laughs> The Gospel Truth. I had help all over the place with this morning's lesson. It's a study in New Testament books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the goal for this morning's lesson is that students will embrace similarities and differences to create a complete picture of the Gospels, the Gospel truth. I want to begin by asking a question. What are your views concerning firsthand, secondhand, or even thirdhand information? What are your views? Yes, over here. I would tend to think that first-hand information would be closest to the truth. And then when you get to second, third, fourth, fifth, and all that hearsay stuff, it gets embellished, it gets uh, things left out, it gets things added, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's the furthest from the truth. Amen. So first-hand information is closest to the truth. First-hand information is, is eyewitness information. And second-hand information uh, could, it comes from a, most likely a first-hand eyewitness. But as we look at this, sometimes we, what, what we have to do is to consider the source. Because uh, there are some people that will tell you something and you question what you've heard. We know some people that if you ask them what time it is, you check your watch when they tell you. <laughs> because we kind of question the source. Well, today we're going to be talking about the Gospels, which are first and second-hand information. So we'll begin by asking the question, I'll begin by asking the question, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Right here. Um, the gospel is the story of Jesus. Amen. And it's called the good news. The good news. The good news. In your handout here, it's in the, it says that the gospel comes from the old English word God spell which means good tidings or good news. And in Christianity, the good news refers to the imminent coming of the kingdom of God. 
So the word gospel does not appear anywhere in the Old Testament, but it's listed in the New Testament or mentioned in the New Testament over a hundred times. The gospel or good news refers to the announcement that Jesus has brought the reign of God to our world through his life, his death, and his resurrection from the dead. So the gospel tells us about a gift from God that is free. And that free gift is salvation. Salvation. The gospel answers five questions that I have here. Who is Jesus? What has he done? Why has he done this? How do we know it's true? And how should we respond? Amen? So let's take a look at uh, your handout on page one of what is the gospel. If I could get somebody to read that for us, please. Since we didn't have this lesson ahead of time, I'm going to be calling on people to read different commentaries. Someone read for us the first one. What is the gospel? Thank you. What is the gospel? Jesus lived during a period of great literary activity, the age of military memoirs, of philosophical writings, of great poetry and history. Within a generation after his ascension, the account of Jesus has spread over the known world and had enlisted thousands of devoted followers. Naturally, there was a great demand for written narratives of his life. Whatever other writings there may have been that narrate the life of Jesus perish. The ones that survived are those which we have in the New Testament, which God preserved as being sufficient to convey his word to all future generations. The first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are known as Gospels. This is probably because they record the gospel or good news of the coming of Jesus Christ, the world's Savior. The Gospels are not biographies of Jesus and make no attempt to give a detailed or chronological account of Jesus' life. Nevertheless, they give all the facts that people need to know in order to believe in Jesus as the Son of God and so have life through him. Amen. So the Gospels are not a biography of Jesus and don't attempt to be. But continuing on, we see that while each of the Gospels are united in their purpose to record the life of Jesus, the Gospel message, each author takes a slightly different approach. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote to different people from various countries, different racial backgrounds, and their religious backgrounds. And in spite of their differences, there is no disagreement in the picture of Jesus Christ. No disagreement in the picture of Jesus Christ. He is divine and human, meaning he is all God and he is all man. He is Lord of all and the Savior of people everywhere. Even in the light of their differences, we know each author considered their message to be of the utmost importance. They understood they had a great responsibility to accurately record historical events and to give their audience corresponding religious truths. Within these four accounts, the writers meet Jesus as, number one, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, and number two, an authoritative teacher, and three, our Redeemer. As our salvation depends on the truth of the gospel message found within these four books, the reliability of the gospels is crucial, the bedrock of our faith. So on page one, there's a question that it says, what is the main purpose of the gospel? What is the main purpose it's in the back here? Excuse me. The main purpose of the gospel is to present Jesus as the Savior of the world and to let the people know that he is the Son of God. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Why is there more than one gospel? We have four. Why do we need more than one? Different periods of time. Amen. They were told by, recorded by different people for different groups of people at different times. So we have four Gospels. Now let's take a look at the, the actual writing of the Gospels. Uh, this is good because just a few weeks ago in our Sunday school lesson, we were talking about Jesus' ministry starting in Galilee 
And he went from town to town, preaching and teaching, performing miracles, healing people. We see that he made his way into Jerusalem on that Passover week. And when he entered into Jerusalem, he was received by shouts of, Hosanna. They were cutting down palm branches and putting in his way so that he could ride in over those palm branches. But, as, but, but if we look at the text, as the week progressed, things changed. Things changed. Jesus, at the Last Supper, identified his betrayer, Judas. And we saw that Judas sold us Jesus out to the, the Jews for 20 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver, thank you. Somebody's paying attention. <laughs> and Judas betrayed Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with a kiss. He was taken to trial. The high court, the Jewish high court, they couldn't carry out capital punishment. They took him to Pilate. Pilate found no fault in Jesus, gave the people a choice. I'll set one of you, I'll set Barabbas free. Or Jesus, you choose. What did the crowd choose? They chose Barabbas. Pilate had Jesus whipped, carried to the cross. He was nailed on the cross. He was crucified, died there, taken down, and placed in a borrowed grave. And our lesson from uh, a couple of weeks ago was the empty tomb and how the women were the first to see the resurrection, the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus, and how they brought that message back. And, and Jesus told them, and the angels told the, the women, tell my disciples, tell Jesus' disciples to go into Galilee and he'll see me there. They'll see me there. And in Galilee, Jesus met his disciples and others, and he commissioned his disciples to carry forth this gospel message. Yes. Different sections of the Bible. Right. They and they uh, said Jesus actually didn't start teaching until he was like twelve years old. Mm -hmm. And in the synagogue. In the synagogue, okay. and then it right. from his. Um, I think the Bible admits most of his uh, childhood. I think it started when he was twelve, and mm -hmm. he started teaching mm -hmm. when he was about twelve years old. I think that's when his parents were trying to get him away from the. The, uh, whoever that was wanted to kill. Well, that was uh, uh, earlier on oh, at early his birth. Yeah. His parents, by le le leading of an angel, had to take him to mm -hmm. Egypt to escape Herod, yeah. who was going to kill him. He was going to kill Jesus. And he stayed in Egypt for a while, and they brought him back at, after some years after Herod had died. Oh, yeah. So... Let's get somebody to read uh, uh, the commentary there that begins soon after Jesus' ascension on page one. Get it back here. Thank you. Soon after Jesus' ascension, his disciples began the task of spreading the good news of the salvation he had brought. They started in Jerusalem and several thousand were converted. This growth took place over a period of about 30 years. Those who became Christians were taught the oral history. They recounted the activities and teachings of Jesus. This emphasis on the life of Jesus was one of reason, was one reason why the apostles had to be purple associates who had been with Jesus from his baptism to his ascension. They could give first-hand accounts of what Jesus said and did, and in particular, could give eyewitness testimony to his resurrection. The apostles carefully instructed new believers who memorized the miracles and sayings of Jesus and went out to spread the good news to others. As the years passed, the church grew. Those who had seen and heard Jesus became fewer in number and more widely scattered in order to preserve what these witnesses taught about Jesus, people began to prepare with an account, written accounts of things Jesus said and did. And this sort of activity, we can see the origin of the four gospels. Amen. Amen. So that's about the writing. 
And a little bit about the background, I put that in the handout as well for each of the uh, gospel writers uh, on page two. We see a, the, there's a text box with biographical uh, background information about the authors. And starting with Mark, we see that uh, his Hebrew name was John. His Roman name was Marcus. And sometime you'll see in scripture he's referred to as John Mark. Mark was a cousin of Barnabas, and he was also a co-laborer of Paul. And the Gospel of Mark was written around A.D. 60. And the audience for that Gospel were Roman Christians. And below that, we have uh, some more information about uh, the Gospel of Mark. It says it's the shortest Gospel and likely the first written. The shortest Gospel and likely the first written. Question. What is the very first book written in the New Testament? No. What is the very first written New Testament book? Written. The very first written New Testament book. First Thessalonians was written in A.D. 50. Mark was not written until A.D. 60. And it's the shortest book and likely the first written. And that should raise a question. Well, wait a minute. Isn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? That's not the order in which they were written. The early church fathers, well after uh, the church was founded, after Jesus' ascension, a well, hundred years later, they decided to put the, the books in order that would help people in their Christian journey, to help them understand who Jesus is. And so what they did was... They started with the book of Matthew, put that first because it has the genealogy in it. So it's sort, of, it's sort of like Genesis. That's why Matthew is first. But Mark was the first written gospel. Okay, and we see that Mark was, uh, Mark's gospel is based upon uh, Peter's teachings. Uh, Mark was a scribe of Peter. And he assisted the apostle Peter in missionary work that took him through uh, the north of Asia Minor and brought him eventually to Rome. We see that when Peter left to go on further journeys, Mark remained for a while in Rome. And the Roman Christians asked Mark to write down a history of Jesus as they had heard it from Peter. So Peter has left Rome. They want to hear more about Jesus. So they asked Mark to write down what he remembered from Peter's preaching. Amen? If we look at the next one here, Luke. Luke was a Gentile. He was a physician by trade. He was an associate of Paul, and Luke's gospel was written around 65 to 80 AD, somewhere in that time frame. So I'm going to ask somebody to read on page two where it says Luke was written by the only. If someone could get somebody to read that, Sister Butler, thank you. Luke, written by the only non-Jew, is of special importance in evangelism and discipleship in the Gentile world. Mm. The Gospel of Luke was written by Theophilus, a government official of some importance, who became a Christian convert. Luke's purpose was to give a trustworthy account of the origins of Christianity. Luke's book was eventually divided into two books, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. Apostles. Luke clearly noted his use of many eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts in his work. During a two-year stay in Palestine, Luke did much research, gathering materials and interviewing people still living in Palestine who had seen and heard Jesus. Luke's gospel focuses on historical evidence and demonstrates that the Christian faith is extended to the Gentiles. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we see that Luke's gospel was written for Roman Christians. And I'm sorry, Mark's gospel was written for Roman Christians. And Luke's gospel was written for a Roman official named Theophilus. And he was to put together a trustworthy account of Christianity. Now let's look at Matthew. Matthew's gospel was written around 65 to 80 AD as did well. Luke, yes. Uh, did Luke write Acts? Yes, Luke wrote, Luke wrote uh, the Gospel of Luke 
and it was and it included initially the acts of the apostles but it was so long that they divided it over time into two separate books the gospel of luke and then the acts of the apostles Lord, when he wrote it for Theophilus, it was one large work. Matthew, his, uh, again, his gospel was written uh, 65 to 80 AD. His Hebrew name was Levi. Max, Ma Matthew was a tax collector. He was a Jew, a tax collector, and that was a very unpopular job to have because Matthew, as a tax collector, was uh, collecting taxes for the Roman government, and he was also taken a little on the side for himself. So uh, he was hated by most of the Jews. So Levi changed his name to Matthew, which means the gift of God, after becoming a disciple of Jesus. He was also an apostle of Jesus, sent by Jesus. Matthew's audience were Jewish Christians living among Jews. This is a time uh, in which the Jewish faith was still strong, and those early Christians who early Jews who believed in Jesus were referred to as of the way or Jewish Christians. They were kind of, kind of tugging between two worlds, still following the Jewish tradition, but having a strong belief in Jesus the Christ. So Matthew didn't want them to turn back to, to Judaism. And then finally, we have uh, John. John's gospel was the last gospel written around 90 A.D., we know that John was the son of Zebedee and Salome, a sister of Mary. So that made uh, John a cousin of Jesus. We see that John was a fisherman by trade. John was also an apostle of John the Baptist first and then Jesus. And John's audience was Jewish Christians. So I get somebody to read uh, as John was the last written gospel on page two. We'll pick up that commentary. Thank you. And leaves out many events already mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. A small community of Christians lived in ancient Ephesus during the late first century AD. They had learned the remarkable news about Jesus and the accounts of his life from the Apostle Paul. Then John moved to Ephesus and settled there, bringing his own recollection of Jesus' life and ministry. And in his later years, John wrote these recollections down. John desire, John's desire was for his followers to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of miracles as he had. John 20, 29. John's authority and deep experience is evident throughout the gospel, his gospel. As an eyewitness to Jesus' life, John 19.35, John had heard, seen, and touched the word of life. 1 John 1, 1 through 4. Amen. He had heard, seen, and touched the word of life. So much of John's gospel consists of teaching. Most of that teaching comes from the recorded words of Jesus himself. More than 90% of the material in John's gospel is not found in the other gospels. If we only had the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we may think that Jesus' public ministry only lasted a year. But if we look at, at John's gospel, we see that it records more of his work in the region of Judea, particularly in and around Jerusalem. It also provides information that clearly shows the ministry of Jesus lasted at, at least three years. For example, John mentions three specific Passover feasts. Amen? Question, which of the gospel authors were apostles of Jesus? Which of the gospel authors were apostles of Jesus? John and, and Matthew, and Matthew. Any other comments before we move on? Well, I want to move on then to uh, the next topic, uh, the synoptic gospels. But first, we're going to start with a, a definition. What does the word synoptic mean? 
Anybody know that offhand? Synoptic. In the back here, all the way in the back. Thank you. Say that again. Okay, amen. Thank you. The word synoptic comes from the Greek word synoptikos and can be broken down with sin, S-I-N, meaning together, and optic meaning view or sight. So something that is synoptic pulls everything together to see the whole in a cohesive manner. Amen. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. They were written about 20 to 30 years after the ascension of Jesus. And they differ from the Gospel of John in that they closely mirror one another in their accounts. In these three Gospels, we see similar wording, timelines, and Old Testament references. While we would expect consistent narratives in all the Gospels, the similarities in the synoptic seem to suggest that they were written in reliance upon one another or an outside source, such as eyewitness accounts. Even within these similarities, we still find content that is unique to one or two books, do these similarities discredit the authors or challenge the authority of the writers? This particular question is known as the synoptic problem, meaning that there are similarities and, and content and words and timelines. However, when you layer out the events side by side, we see a stronger relationship between the content, and it draws our attention to the details that we may have otherwise overlooked. Some people would argue about the discrepancies in the, in the time and details. A good example is if we look at uh, in the Gospel of Mark and Matthew, they both record uh, this, uh, the event of Jesus walking on the water. Prior to that, Jesus had fed a multitude with uh, five loaves and two fish. That was a miracle. He sent the disciples into a boat and so they could cross to Genesaret. And Jesus sent the multitudes away, and he went up to the mountain to pray. Both Mark and Matthew record that. But as the boat was out on the water, the winds came up, and they were fierce. They had trouble rowing. Jesus walked from the shore out toward the boat. And in Mark's account, they did not recognize Jesus, and they thought it was a spirit. And Jesus walked into the boat, and, it, and that gospel account ended there. But if you look at Matthew, the 14th chapter, it has the same event. But the difference is, in, in, in the Matthew account, it says that Peter says, Lord, is that you? And if it is you, bid me to come towards you. And Jesus told him to come. What happened? He stepped out onto the boat. He started walking on the water. Then something else happened. Took his eyes off Jesus and he sunk like a rock. And Jesus had to reach down and pick him up. Now, that's important. They both record Jesus walking on the water. But in Matthew's account, we see that it also is relevant to us in that when we fall down, Jesus will pick us up. He'll pick us up. So now, is it a contradiction then or a confirmation when the Gospels have similar events but some differences between them? So while studying the Gospels is helpful, I'm on uh, page three, it's helpful to compare all the accounts of the same event, just like this event of Jesus walking on the water. And if we put it all together, we see that they tell similar information, but there are differences. But if we bring it together, we have a more complete message. So let's do a little exercise. I need somebody to read Perspective and perception is on page number four. A volunteer to read, please. All the way up front here, we got a volunteer. Oh, Perspective has. can be defined as the single, as the angle or direction in which a person looks at an object. 
A definition of perception is a particular way of understanding or thinking about something. The ability to understand what is important and what isn't. In other words, people looking at an object may look at it from the same perspective, but may have very different and personal perceptions. What we see is not always what someone else sees. Taking in as many perceptions from different perspectives of a situation is often valuable to get a complete picture. Thank you. Amen. Perspective is the angle in which we look at something, and perception is the information we gather from it. You know how sometimes when we're driving along, we see something in the road, and we may think, that's a dead animal. But when we get a little closer, it's a rag. So if we, inc if we increase our perception, our perspective, if we increase our perspective, we can get better information, better information. There's a picture in your book. I guess people wonder, what does he have up there under there? Amen. What do you see? A vase. I heard somebody say a jug. All the way in the back. I want somebody all the way in the back there. What do you see? A jug. Okay. Uh, another one in the back. A, a, jug, a jug with tape on it. Okay. I see a cookie jar. A cookie jar. She see a cook. Somebody else saw a cookie jar. Cookie jar. Cookie jar. Okay. This cookie jar. What's that? A teapot. She sees a teapot. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask for a volunteer to come up front. Think of this way, right? <laughs> Could you come up and help us, please? Could you take a look at this? I want you to thoroughly examine it. And you tell us, what is that? Oh, look at that. She opened it up. <laughs> what is that, Sister Wainwright? It's a container. She says, it looks like a jar holding something. But what's significant about this, this jar? It's, she said, it's, it's painted. What? It belongs in the kitchen. She said, it's painted. What about the painting? It has, it has flowers in it. Different color flowers. Did you see that from the back? That it had different color flowers? What color are the flowers in the back? Burgundy? Burgundy? Red? Purple? So the, so the point is, from your perspective, it might look burgundy. And from your perspective in the back, you may have only seen one color. But when you get close, like our, our assistant here, Deaconess Wainwright, you see that there's more than one color flower on this. And when you get closer, you could say, well, maybe this is a, a cookie jar. Thank you, Deaconess Wainwright. Thank you. Now, I don't cook, okay? I don't cook. Everybody knows that. But what I have in here is something that I put together. It has no sugar in it. It has no salt. It has no butter. So it has no calories. It won't raise your blood pressure. Won't affect your sugar level. How many would like a treat? you a treat. Somebody back there said, I don't want none. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> I'll give you a treat. Anybody else want a treat? I only got a couple treats left. Brother Richardson, you want a treat? You want a treat? Here's the last treat. All right, you had your chance. All gone. Uh, just, just a few. Hold on to those. We'll come back to those later. So perspective 
and perception are important. The closer we get, the better we improve our perspective, the more information, the better our perception improves. How does that apply to the Gospels, Brother Davis? I'm so glad you asked. We're going to look at some scripture now with perspective and perception in mind. First, we're going to start with the first scripture, series of scriptures is from the baptism of Jesus. I want somebody to, uh, to read for us Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. A volunteer. Thank you. Matthew 3, 13 to 17. Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answered, said unto him, Suffer it to be so, so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lightened upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am very pleased. Amen. Amen. So we're going to use our perspective. We're going to increase our perspective and our perception. We're going to get closer to the word of God to improve our understanding. This particular event, the baptism of Jesus, is recorded in all four Gospels. In Matthew, we see that uh, Jesus has come to Galilee, to the Jordan, to be baptized by John the Baptist. Finally, Jesus the Messiah that John the Baptist has been preaching about has arrived. In verse 14, we see that, but John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. Thou comest to me. Jesus is insisting that John baptize him. But John thinks that Jesus should baptize him. So there was a back and forth discussion here in Matthew. And in 15, Jesus answered and said to him, suffer it, allow it now. So we see that even though John resists at first, he does baptize Jesus. And in verse 16, we see the account of after Jesus is baptized, he comes straightway up out of the water. And the heavens open up, and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and lighted upon him. And in, in verse 17, we see the voice from heaven of God. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the voice of God says that Jesus is his son and he is pleased. That's Matthew's account of the baptism of Jesus. If you move over to Mark chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, we see that Mark starts out where it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. Agrees with Matthew's. He agrees. Jesus came from Galilee to be baptized by John the Baptist. Verse 10 says, and straight when he came about of the water, and he saw the heavens open, and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. Here we see, however, there's no discussion in Mark's gospel about Jesus and John the Baptist debating about who's going to baptize whom. But we still see that, that the Holy Spirit is descending on him like a dove. And then finally, in verse 11, the voice of God from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. So Mark also includes this in his gospel, and the audible voice of God the Father saying that Jesus is his Son, and he's well pleased. If we move over to Luke on page 5, chapter 3, verses 21 to 22, we see that Mark's gospel is a little bit different here. Matter of fact, if you looked at the verses before this in Mark's gospel, Mark would have recorded that John the Baptist was put in jail. But here we see, now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized, past tense. He's already been baptized, praying, and the heaven was open. Again, Mark doesn't make any mention here of the location of the baptism or the discussion between John the Baptist and Jesus. But we know that John was the one baptizing, and he was baptizing in the Jordan. In verse 22, and the heavenly Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven that said, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So Luke also includes the holy affirmation from God that Jesus is his Son. 
Now, let's look at, finally, the fourth verse of the gospel, John, which is on page six. In this particular gospel, we see that John begins, the apostle John begins his gospel, the next day, John the Baptist see of Jesus coming and saith unto him, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. That's prophecy. That's prophecy. John is telling the crowd, this is the sacrifice of God, which will take away all your sins. No bull, no ram, no goat, no dove, only the blood of Jesus will take away the sins of the world. And in verse 30, he said, this is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, wait a minute. We know that in Matthew's gospel, it records that John the Baptist's parents were Zacharias and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was pregnant with child. So was Mary. Mary went to see Elizabeth. Elizabeth was further along in her pregnancy. John the Baptist was born first. But what John is talking about is something else here. He's saying that John is acknowledging that Jesus is greater than him. John the Baptist was a forerunner. John isn't talking about the order in which they were born. He's talking about the commission from God, the commission from God. And he says in verse 31, I knew him not. They were cousins. I have 51 first cousins. I don't know all my cousins. Saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and abode upon him. John is given testimony about seeing the spirit descend. And he says, I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same saith unto me, unto whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. John is baptizing with water. But he's saying, Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. There are two baptisms. There's a water baptism and a spirit baptism. What's the difference? One saves. Okay, if you look at these events, there are 12 events here. 12 events. Jesus comes from Galilee. That's recorded in Mark and Matthew. Jesus goes to the Jordan to be baptized. That's in all four Gospels. Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, all four Gospels. John calls Jesus the Lamb of God. Only one gospel, John. Jesus and John debate. Only one gospel. Jesus comes uh, straightway up out of the water. Only in two. Uh, heavens open up. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And four, the voice from heaven. And three, God spoke to John from above. Only in John's gospel. God calls Jesus my beloved son. All four gospels. God is well pleased with his son. If you take all 12 of those events, we get a better picture of the baptism of Jesus. Amen? We, have, we are running out of time. I want to move to one more. One more. Where does the time go? What time does the class end? Quarter to nine? Okay. My watch says it's nine o'clock. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the next scripture we're going to look at with, pers with perspective and perception Jesus cleanses a leper that comes from that's in three the synoptic gospels I want somebody to read for us well first of all leprosy leprosy is known as Hansen's disease it's a chronic infectious disease this disease mainly affects the skin and we know that leprosy is, can occur at all ages, ranging from early infancy to a very old age. Leprosy is no longer something to fear. Today, it's rare. Most people live a normal life after treatment. But in, ancient, in the ancient world, leprosy was terrible. It was a destructive disease with no hope of improvement. So a leper who came to Jesus with a, had a great sense of need and depression. Leprosy was so hopeless that healing a leper was compared to raising the dead. So let's look at Matthew. We're going to read it from Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. We're going to talk about Jesus cleansing a leper. Thank you. Matthew 8, 4. 
Matthew 8, 1 through 4, KJV version. When he came down from the mountains, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshiped, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thy clean. Mm -hmm. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See that I tell no man, but go thy way, true thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Amen. We're going to go through this again with perspective, angle of vision, and perception, what we get out of. Put ourselves in this one, ourselves. This is after the Sermon on the Mount and, and Matthew's account. And we see that the law required lepers to be isolated. But this particular leper defies the law, and he approaches Jesus. And in verse 2, it says, And there behold, came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou shalt make me clean. He calls Jesus Lord, which is uh, their way of saying Yahweh. Lord, make me clean. He didn't say heal me. He said make me clean. Make me clean. In other words, he just wanted his life to return to some semblance of normalcy. Make me clean. And Jesus did something that they thought was unheard of. He put forth his hand and he touched him and he said, thou be clean. The leper kept his distance from Jesus. But Jesus defied the law, touched him and cleansed him. He's no longer a leper. He's no longer an outcast. Put ourselves in it. Jesus told him, don't tell anybody. Go show yourself to the priests. Offer the, the sacrifices that Moses has commanded for a testimony. So Jesus is telling them to do this because if you go to the priests and they, you offer the sacrifices, go through the ceremony, washings, this, that, and the other, they'll say you're clean. You can go back to your family. You can go to the market. You can come to service. That's what he was saying. Now, if we look at Mark's account, we see that Mark records a leper coming to Jesus. And just imagine, Jesus is coming to town, and there's a crowd. His disciples are with him, and there's a crowd. But this leper makes his way through the crowd, and he beseeches Jesus. He's falling down on his knees. The leper is begging Jesus, saying, make me clean. He didn't, again, he didn't say, heal me. Make me clean. Jesus, it says in Mark's God, he was moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. Jesus had compassion for the outcast. Touching the leper, he made him, would make him unclean as well. But God is never unclean. And we see that as he spoke, the leprosy immediately left him. And with one touch from Jesus, the leper is made whole. Only one touch. I heard you. Only one touch. Again, he tells him, don't tell anybody. Offer the sacrifices. And if we look at the Luke's account, we see something very similar. similar. But this time, Luke is saying, behold, a man full of leprosy. The others just said he was a leper. This account says he was full of leprosy. You know what that means? His leprosy was so great, it couldn't be hidden. It could not be hidden. It wasn't on his shoulder, or his, his chest, or on his arm. It was all over him. And that's how sin is. It can be all over us. All over us. And he fell on his face. And he begged Jesus, saying, if you will, you can make me clean. And again, Jesus touched him, doing the unthinkable, and made him clean. Charging him, don't tell anybody. Go to the priest, offer the sacrifices. But this man went abroad and told everybody. And great multitudes came to hear and be healed by his infirmities. So we have three accounts here. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record Jesus healing the leper with similar details. But Matthew says the leper openly worshiped Jesus, asking him to be cleansed of his leprosy. 
Mark and Luke says the leper begged him. Mark says the leper fell to his knees while Luke says he fell prostrate on the ground and worshiped him. And Luke says the man was full of leprosy, too much to be hidden. All acknowledge Jesus has the power to cleanse. Matthew says Jesus was full of compassion for the leper. And in all accounts, against prohibitions, Jesus touched the man and healed him. Jesus tells the man to tell no one and to go his way. What do you think of that? Three accounts of the same event. But as we sharpen our perspective, we can get a closer view, a better understanding of what transpired. We only have, what, 10 minutes? 10 minutes. We have one last, one last. I'm going I'm to get this in. This last scripture is from, is, is the Jesus cleansing the temple. It's in all four of the gospels. If I could get somebody to read for us Matthew's account, which is Matthew 21, 12 through 13. Matthew 21, 12, 13. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bore in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seat of them that sold drugs and said unto them, it is written, my house should not be called a house of prayer, but ye, ye have made it a den of thieves. Amen, a den of thieves. So in Matthew's account, we see that Jesus has gone into the temple. When Jesus arrives in the city, he usually goes into the temple. That's his practice. And when he gets in there, he sees something abominable. He casts out the merchants and overturns the tables of the money changers. That's in verse 12. And in verse 13, we see Jesus is using this opportunity to teach. He uses, math, he uses Isaiah 56 and 7 when he talks about house of prayer, even in Matthew's, I'm sorry, Isaiah 56 and 7 says, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be acceptable upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. And then he says that you've made it a den of thieves. He's referencing Jeremiah 7 and 11. Is this house which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. That's Matthew's account. In Mark's account, we see that Jesus has come to Jerusalem again to the temple. He's casting out uh, the, the, the money changers who are, who are selling doves. But Mark also includes another action taken by Jesus. He says in verse 13, and would not suffer any man to carry any vessel through the temple. We have to understand that the temple complex was large, and the outer court was the court of the Gentiles. Anybody could come into the court of Gentiles. And what he was noticing was people were using the court of the Gentiles as a shortcut to get from point A to point B. Instead of going all the way around the temple complex, they were carting stuff through the court of the Gentiles to get to the other side. So he said, stop that. We also see that Jesus was teaching again about his God's house being a house of prayer for all nations. As in Matthew, it was meant to be a place where Israelites and God-fearing foreigners could worship and pray to Jehovah. If we switch over to Luke's account on page eight near the bottom, Luke omits some of the events and Mark, Matthew, and even John. Jesus goes into the temple. He cast out those that sold their end and bought. Talks about it being a house of prayer. You've made a den of thieves. That's where he ends. Now, John does something else. Bottom of page 8, John chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. And found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep. John adds other animals that they were selling because they were needed for sacrifices. When people were traveling from out of town to come to Jerusalem to participate in the holy events, 
they had to bring a sacrifice. If it was too far to travel, they would get there and they would have to buy one. And they had to take their money and buy an animal. And they also had to pay a temple tax. You couldn't pay the temple tax in foreign currency. So there had to be a money changing going on. Here's this, old, here's this foreign money, here's the temple tax, and it's a different exchange rate. <laughs> so there's a profit being made. Jesus, in John's gospel, makes a scourge of, of small cords. He makes a whip, and he chases out those with that whip, those that sold doves. Don't make my house a marketplace. They had turned it into Bel Air Market. They had turned it into the Monument Street Market, Pennsylvania Avenue Market, Lexington Market. Did I hit them all? <laughs> and he said, and his disciples remembered something. It says in verse 17, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Psalm 69, 9a. For the zeal of your house, the fervent love that I have for your house and service and glory of your people, that's the zeal, hath eaten me up. In other words, I'm exhausted, filled up by your spirit. So here we have accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus cleansing the temple. We don't have a time. Was that the first bell? My wife is... My wife is putting up the hand. I don't know which hand it is. She's frustrated with me now. That's all, because he, he's not paying any attention to me anymore. I love you. I love you. <laughs> so if we look at this, we don't have time right now. That was the first bill. We're going to have some homework. In your book, there is a graph, a chart at the bottom that says, Jesus clears the temple, gospel comparison chart. And I've listed some events. So your homework will be, because we don't have time, when you go home, look at this, ac this account of Jesus clearing the temple and see if you can determine in which gospel did these actions occur. Because all of these things happened, but in which gospels did they occur? Amen? <clears throat> so, who is Jesus? Son of God, Savior, what has he done? Died on the cross for the sins. Died on the cross for our sins. He's given us the plan of salvation. How do we know that this is true? Because of his word. It's recorded in his word. And then how should we respond? with obedience, with obedience. In this lesson today, we talked about perspective and perception. We need to get closer, closer to God's word so that we can get a better understanding, closer. You know how it is when you read a scripture and you say, I don't know that I really understand what I read. And we pray that the Holy Spirit gives us understanding. And the next time we pick it up, Oh my, that's what, that's what it was, the Holy Spirit was trying to tell me. We have to get closer, closer to the word of God. Because if we get closer to God's word, we get more information. Our perception improves. So we're at the end. Take a closer look. When we look at the gospels for comparison, we must be careful not to get distracted by discrepancies or differences in details but search for the essential events and message. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not simply write what happened in the past. They did not write a story that had an ending, but an account of Jesus' life and ministry that was a beginning, the beginning of the church and the kingdom of God. Two of the gospel writers, Matthew and John, actually walked with Jesus. They had a very personal relationship with him. They saw him perform miracles firsthand, when they wrote their gospel, inspired by the Holy Spirit, they were recalling events they witnessed or firsthand testimonies and what was significant to them from their perspective. 
when we look at the Gospels, it's helpful to see what each writer has to say about the same event. Then we can, make the we can take the similarities and include the differences to get a better picture of the events themselves. The last three pages of your handout is a partial index of the events that took place in the four Gospels. It lists the event, the book, chapter, and verse where these events took place. This is not a complete list, but it may help you in your Bible study. I passed out some treats. Open your treat. Everybody didn't get one yet. <laughs> well, the, yell out your treat. What was your treat? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Who had another treat over here? I told you they were fat free. <laughs> oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. Psalms 34, 8. Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Over here. But he answered and said, it is written, men shall not eat, live by bread alone, and, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4 and 4. Amen. We don't live by bread. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, God, was with God, and the Word was God. Amen, amen. And one last one right here. The sower soweth the Word, Mark 4, 14 KJV version. Amen, amen. Word, word. I want to thank everybody for participating in the Sunday School lesson this morning. <laughs> Praise God. I want to end with the scripture. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1, verse 16. I want to thank everybody for their attention and for their participation. In preparation for next week, we're going to be back in our regular classes. And for next week's lesson, that's going to come from Romans chapter 8. In preparation for next week's lesson, Think about something you are hoping for in the near future. Amen? Let's now stand and be dismissed in prayer. Father God, once again, we thank you. We thank you for allowing your Holy Spirit to be in the midst of us this morning. We thank you, O oh Father God, that you've allowed us to arrive here safe. And now, Lord, we're preparing ourselves to hear the word from on high. We just praise your holy name. Bless our pastor, Father God. Hold him up, Lord God, to bring forth your message to your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.